I hope that people are just willing to acknowledge this game that we're all playing, this thing that we don't talk about. You know, power is so interesting. It's something that we all want and work towards, but in order to be on top, someone's got to be at the bottom. Let's talk about your journey to bringing this to audiences like this so you could totally mess with their head the way that you just did with this group. Um, what was your journey towards Blink Twice? What were you thinking when you finally sat down to type this screenplay? I was, it was more what I was feeling than what I was thinking. There wasn't a lot of thinking involved. Um, but it was a lot of anger, <laughs> a lot of rage, um, and also just being so curious about power and what that does to us and what power is. It's like this strange entity and wanting to try and highlight the absurdity of what women are expected to do. We're expected to smile through our pain and our trauma. We are asked and expected to pretend like everything's okay when it's not and we are expected to forget and forgive. Uh, and then we're treated like we're crazy when we respond. Um, I love that, again, I've seen this movie twice, and it took me until, like, last night to just get how many layers you're on. It's like, oh, blink twice if you're, in, like, it's literally like a call for help. Like, I just, again, took, I'm a little slow, kids, but I love it. I love it. Um, but for you, I just think about your career. I mean, I think I read somewhere where you were on sets at, like, age two, and then, of course, you became an actor, and we've seen your incredible work. But I just think about all these collaborators that you've worked with up until this moment, knowing that you were going to be a first-time director, writer, producer <laughs> for this endeavor. Were there any people that you sought out for advice and, like, hey, I'm going to do this thing and helped you sort of, again, birth this incredible baby? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have had the honor of working with some incredible directors, and I've always been an observer when I'm on set. You know, I had just worked with Steven Soderbergh and talked to him a lot and was so inspired by how intentional he is because he edits everything himself. He's so specific about how he shoots scenes. He doesn't just, some people just, you know, wide, medium, close up, and he's he knows exactly what he wants. And, you know, especially when you don't have a lot of time um, it was really helpful to learn from him in terms of how to use your time effectively. And you know, work, I had just worked with Matt Reeves as well, who is so specific and pays immense uh, attention to detail, and that was really ins inspi inspiring to me. And also working with George Miller, who, uh, you know, when you have an idea that only lives in your mind, like an entire world, like Mad Max, and having to bring that to life and explain to people what you're seeing in your mind. I, you know, watching him do that was really, really beautiful. It's interesting you mentioned George Miller because we had a conversation when Naomi was president. She definitely talked about the specificity of everything. You can see the intentionality in every single choice you make from the dresses to being something that you can tie the girls up with to the type of nails that Naomi had. And knowing that, knowing how specific you probably were with the script and the pre-production, I imagine there was a moment when Zoe Kravitz, the director, really wanted to yell at Zoe Kravitz, the writer, to be like, why did you write this? Because I don't know how to do it. And then you had to execute it. Like, I'm just curious, what was that moment where you were like, why did we write this? Every I love day. doing it. Every day I was like, it's cool. We'll just get like a snake and that'll be fine. And then we'll light the building on fire. That's okay, right? Um, you know, yeah, these dresses, I mean, I remember on set realizing these dresses have to function. I have to figure out how to actually make these work. Um, but that's kind of part of the joy of directing is, you know, problem solving and figuring things out. It's, it's, um, it's part of what I love about creating. Um, I'm glad that you were, look, she's putting such a happy spin on it because I, I love that because it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of dedication. It's oh, a lot it's of, fucked up. Dude. Yeah. It's <laughs> super fucked up. <laughs> but it's good. You know, the, the baby's out in the world, the blood, sweat, and tears, the proof is in the pudding. And I, I've seen the reactions like in the audience, the way this is like such a roller coaster ride when you watch it. Uh, with that being said, it's some pretty powerful wish fulfillment too. Like there's so many moments from the script that I absolutely love. 
love. Um, obviously, Beyonce is one of them. Um, that Beyonce moment with Naomi <laughs> and her walking back, that's great. But what's your favorite sort of moment from this one? Because again, you just put so many moments in there that literally made you kind of want to stand up and cheer. Don't deny it, y'all wanted to. <laughs> Maybe not on the men, but the girls did. <laughs> I, I have a lot of moments that I love, and I think one of my favorite things about this film is that there's so many different uh, emotions at once, and it kind of depends on what mood I'm in, like what I respond to the most. You know, sometimes, I, I mean, I love when Naomi, you know, gets up to dance, and that whole sequence is really exciting. Um, I also really love the scene where her and Audria, her and Sarah, start figuring things out together and teaming up and piecing things together. Um, and I also, my, one of my favorite scenes is the, the fat blunt scene when they're smoking the fat blunt. Um, that was a really, it's such a complex scene. I was, you know, ask, asking a lot of my actors in terms of, you know, how to play so many emotions at once. And that scene in particular, it wasn't working for a long time when we were shooting. And I realized it was because Naomi and Audrey are such good actors that I was like believing them that they were okay. And I was trying to figure out how to communicate what I wanted. And I was like, act badly. <laughs> Be awkward, you're too talented, tone it down. And that was when we found this kind of like psychotic thing. Um, and it was, it was amazing to, to watch them find that. I mean, it's a testament you talk about the incredible cast, starting with Naomi Aki, like let's just give it up for her and everything amazing. that she does in this performance. And you ask so much of her. I said last night, you put her face on the ground for a good portion of this movie with like a, just a camera at her. How did you find this, uh, especially the female side of this ensemble, um, but starting with Naomi, because really the movie lives and dies in her eyes. Can I just say that there's, one? I have to find this photo and I'm gonna sh show it to you. Um, but Naomi Aki is one of the hardest working people I've ever met in my life. There's a picture that I have where we were doing a night shoot and you know we worked her literally into the ground. And you know, it's the moment where Stan, the security guard, has a gun to her head and she's in the dirt and he's, she's got like one arm and she hadn't had time to eat. And so I was like, let me get you a sandwich, someone get Naomi food. And I brought Naomi a sandwich, but we were also lining up the shot. And I was like, Kim, eat your sandwich. And she was like, no, no, babe, it's fine, just hand it over. <laughs> and I have this picture with a literal, like a gun to her head and one hand and the sandwich in the other hand. And I was like, Naomi fucking Aki. <laughs> You are a hardworking motherfucker. Um, but yeah, she's just so brilliant. And you know, when I sent her the script, uh, it was that kind of thing. I keep on comparing the script to a destination wedding where it's so weird and out there that you know, when you have a destination wedding, a lot of people don't show up, but those are kind of the people you don't want there anyway. Um, and so the people who got it were the people, like, they, I'm like, oh, you're my people. And when Naomi read the script, she understood the tone, she understood the character, and it was just so easy. And she is just, it flows out of her. And it's like a juggling act. I'm asking her to hold every emotion at once, and she does it so easily. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and then the women around her, not, I, we haven't talked about Gina effing Davis, like, and these incredible, a lot of them newcomers or new faces for a lot of folks. Um, what about them? Because I love how there's some archetypal stuff, there's some avatar stuff going on with these ladies um, and what they're representing in these moments. So how did you choose them? Because again, like Naomi, it has to all kind of come together. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the to the film just because ensemble films are so are so difficult. But you know, I really did try so hard to develop these characters as much as I I could, and even the things that aren't on the screen. You know, we did know who everybody was. We knew everybody's backstory. You know, I really wanted to be as specific as I as I could, um, and it was just about finding people that felt familiar almost in a way, you know, specifically the newcomers, the new faces, like True Mullen, who plays Heather, the stoner chick who's incredible. I thought she talked that way until I met her on set. She was like, uh, what's up? And I was like, and then I met her on set and she was like, hey, I'm True, and I'm like, oh, you're a genius. <laughs> um, I wanted a female Spicoli and she like nailed that. 
Um, and then Liz Sierra, who with the curly hair, who's also just, she did that monologue that you see her do at the table and um, for her audition. And, you know, playing drunk, like we were saying, is so difficult to do. And she just smoked that scene. And I was just, I called Carmen Cuba, my casting director, and I was like, hire her yesterday. I don't know who she is, but find her. Um, yeah, and, and just, you know, wanting to write parts for women that we don't get to see a lot of the time. Women don't get to be funny in the way that we really are, you know, often enough. Um, and then also hold, you know, dramatic scenes. And it's, I wanted to see them do everything. Talk about Allie and what she's doing. Allie Shawka, oh my yeah. God, she's so brilliant in this film. She's one of my oldest friends. And so she was actually a friend of mine who was just so supportive while I was writing the script. And then when I was casting, I was like, do you want to be in it? <laughs> um, and I was so happy she said yes. And she's just incredible in the film. And perfect in it. Um, speaking of perfect additions, and I do think this is... Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. I could tell that the person behind the camera really liked our leading man. <laughs> and yeah, he yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it looks good. I mean, but what he's doing in that, uh, I uh, advise all of you to see this film again and watch it the next time and just watch what Channing is doing. It is a whole nother movie and it plays a whole different way. But his um, sort of dynamic with Naomi and what he brought to this, it is. It's delicious is the best way that I could say it with how diabolical it is mm -hmm. and how his presence adds so much, like his boyish presence and the sinisterness. Yeah. Um, talk about having him, first of all, as um, your leading man and antagonist in this one, but also helping you craft this one as producer. Jen's an incredible producer. He really... Um he knows a lot about this business. He's done a lot of studio films, and um, he's always been very involved in his work. And so as someone, I'm very much, you know, until recently, you know, I'm like, I'm an actor for hire. I show up and I do whatever. I don't, you know, studio heads aren't calling me and talking to me, you know? And he's been in that position for a long time. So he really knows how it works and was so protective of not only me, but of the story that we wanted to tell. Um, so I was really, really thankful to, to have him as a producer. And, you know, yeah, he's, as an actor, he's just, he's so wonderful. And um, I just had this feeling before I even knew him that there was so much more to him than people had seen. And I also wanted to weaponize his charisma. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> Because I knew that Slater King, to, in order to work for Frida and for the audience, he had to be someone that we felt safe with. And that's Channing Tatum, no? <laughs> it is. I can't watch it. It's so great. Um, another great addition that you got, and I know a little bit, I think folks in this room know a little bit about music clearances mm -hmm. and how difficult that is. I also know that this was a low budget feature. So I'm just going to go ahead. How'd you get Beyonce? Oh. <laughs> That so, is a moment. <laughs> yeah, we had we had not a lot of money for music. We didn't have a music supervisor. Um, and when we were shooting that scene, I was playing music on a speaker because I really wanted Naomi and Andrea to feel like as badass as possible. And they kept on saying, play Beyonce. And I was like, bitch, we can't afford Beyonce. <laughs> um, but, I would, but then I played it and I was like, but you know what's not gonna happen. And then when I was in the edit, I was like, okay, let's just put the song in and see what happens. And then I sent it to my producers in the studio and they were like, you're not gonna get Beyonce. And I was like, I know, but just let's just try. And she, you know, her team showed it to her and she said yes and was very kind and, you know, it's expensive, but not as, e as expensive as it could have been. And I just felt so supported. And I think, you know, obviously she's, you know, kind and I met her throughout the years, but I also think that she wanted to support the story. And yeah, I mean, it makes the movie. <laughs> It, I mean, it really does. And like, I don't think people know that she's very supportive of female directors. And I think, I think you said this, I think she wanted to be a part of this moment because this will be a moment. Like that is going to be a moment that people put up on TikToks and that they talk about. It's like something that you want to like cosplay in almost. So. And it's meta in a way. It's like, it's like what, what's, what do we want in this moment? And then the answer is exactly what Naomi and Audrey were asking for. It's Beyonce. Dead ass. <laughs> As she says. Um, uh, it's, it, 
leads us into one of my favorite two moments of the film, which is how it ends, um, obviously, with the great reveal of uh, Naomi having the perfume, Frida having the perfume, and dragging, uh, <laughs> these two ladies dragging this white man outside to hold him accountable, bookended with that look that she has at the very end. Um, like, again, just, I'm on top of the world. I'd love for you to talk about those two moments and how, yeah, again, like the movie is great, but that is like a Simone Biles sticking the landing, I feel, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, that, and that wasn't always the end of the film. Uh, you know, me and Chan, again, worked on this project together for a long time, but there was a version where the building was on fire and he died inside, and it was like, in the end, and he was like, mm, I think you can go further than that. I think that's too easy for Slater King. And I loved that challenge. And when we found that other ending, it was so delicious and exciting. And it also changed who Frida was completely. And, you know, the fact that, you know, Frida can either, you know, sure, she, she survives, she gets off the island, and then what? She goes back to her life. The only way, I mean, yeah, I think the only way, realistically, that a woman like her, a waitress, a black woman, becomes a billionaire, the chances of that are low. And I know that we like to be like, we're all the same and it all works, but there's not that many female black billionaires. Um, and so I wanted to create that for her. And it's a very complex ending, you know? It's, there's a lot of open-ended questions. Is she ending a cycle? Is she continuing a cycle? Um, you know, yes, did she win, but at what cost? And, you know, when me and Naomi were talking about that last moment where she looks into the camera, which you guys just saw, um, you know, we were really trying to figure out what's the look, you know? Is it a smirk or did you win? Are you happy? And I was like, it's kind of got to be all of it. Um, sorry, Naomi. <laughs> um, and I told Naomi when she did that look, I said, you just gave me the Mona Lisa. It's everything at once. And every time I watch it, I feel something different. Yeah, and I think she's thinking something different mm -hmm. from the, again, I've only seen it twice. You've seen it a <laughs> couple more times. I think everyone watching this, first of all, they're gonna tell everyone that they need to go watch it on August 23rd, um, since they got to see it early. But it's, I think it's interesting that you pose a lot of questions and you put, I think, a lot of things that are currently topics of conversation in this film, but you're not asking the audience um, to decide. You're asking them maybe to just ask more questions. Mm, yeah. So what are the questions that you're hoping maybe folks take from this film out into the world when they go tell people that they need to see it on August 23rd? <laughs> I. I hope that people are just willing to acknowledge this game that we're all playing, this thing that we don't talk about. You know, power is so interesting. It's something that we all want and work towards, but in order to be on top, someone's got to be at the bottom. And, you know, we witness so many things and, you know, decide when to look away and when to, and when to witness things. And um, I just hope that people... Uh, pay a little bit more attention and take accountability and I hope that it creates compassion. You know, this movie is not meant to be a lecture. It's not meant to alienate men. It's not anyone wagging their finger at you. It's an invitation to uh, learn a little bit more about what it's like for us. I love that. Um, well, unfortunately, you cannot stay here all night and talk about um, this film, but I did want to go ahead and say that I, I really particularly loved it, and it is one of my favorite films that I've seen this year, so thank you so much. Thank you so for much. Thank you all for watching it. <laughs>